Well, first off, thank you so much for conducting this interview and for your many years of continued activism thank and solidarity. You. Over the past few years, there's been a reevaluation of violent revolutionary praxis by some intellectuals on the left. What is your position on the role of violence, in this case subjective violence, as opposed to symbolic or objective violence, in movements of liberation? Well, first of all, I'm not familiar with the uh, revival, and I don't know exactly what's being advocated, but uh, is what being advocated that we pick up our guns and overthrow the government? Or? Well, basically, some, some, some theorists have said that we should really look at um, the ethical implications of violence through the lens of, for example, the terror in France, and that it was justified what was done uh, well, maybe, during that time period. Maybe it was done, maybe it was not done, but it was done by a government after the government was established, and it uh, carried out a, a terror campaign, basically, against adversaries. Is that the situation we're in? Some would say we are in, you know, dangerous times with, you well, know... maybe in dangerous times, but are you and I part of a revolutionary government that controls the armed forces and is... Uh, confronted with uh, oppositionists who we're trying to eliminate. We're not in that position, of course, at okay, this Okay, so then that analogy is irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what is relevant? The question would be, is, is violent praxis uh, justified for us to overthrow a government? So, so sh again, should we take our guns there and take our guns. go out in the street and uh, start uh, destroying uh, Chase Manhattan Bank and... Uh, well, if you want to get killed in five minutes, that's a good suggestion. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it has absolutely nothing to do with the world. So there's not even any point discussing. I mean, I think it's a crazy idea myself. Right. But, and, but that, quite apart from that, it's uh, like asking, should we uh, climb on an asteroid and uh, attack the Earth? Oh, okay, maybe. I don't think <laughs> it's a good idea, but why talk about it? So you think this sort of like 20th century revolutionary movements... Uh... It's... Not just 20th century. I mean, uh, it's it, 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 very rare occasions when you can even raise the question. Right. And we're not anywhere near those occasions. Right. If you want to raise the question about some abstract in some philosophy seminar, okay, you can discuss it. So we can discuss are there circumstances in which it might be justified to take up arms to overthrow a, uh, a repressive government? Yeah, sure. For example, I was in favor of uh, uh, the conspirators who tried to kill Hitler. Hmm. I think that was a good thing to do. I was in favor of uh, the partisans who were resisting the Nazis. Uh, I, th I think you give many cases in which uh, resistance to oppression and uh, terror and violence is uh, justified. I'm not a pure pacifist, so I can imagine. However, I think... Uh, it takes, uh, it carries a very heavy burden of proof. I mean, the burden of proof is always on those who choose violence. Sometimes the burden can be met, in my opinion, but it's a heavy, heavy burden. And as I say, now we're in a philosophy seminar, uh, unrelated to the real world. Right. Okay. But if we're talking about the real world, which is what I happen to care about, uh, I don't see much point discussing it. So I don't know what the revival is that you're talking about. Right. There's, uh, in conjunction, there's just been a, a renewed interest, for example, in uh, the Jacobin legacy. There's been a lot of new writings on reevaluating the terror in defense of the terror, uh, justifying the terror, justifying Robespierre and his vision of a, a new France, uh, a revolutionary France, a, a sort of a secular France that was cut from what had happened previously in history. And so this is something, of course, that is promulgated by some in the left who have still connections with um, maybe 20th century communist experiments, this sort of uh, Leninist uh, vanguardism that came about. And, and what do you think is, is, the, is the legacy that we still face in the left of, for example, Jacobinism, Leninism, these sort of things. Well, they're quite different, first of all. In the case of Jacobinism, we could discuss it, but that's uh, now we're back in a philosophy seminar, mm -hmm. an interesting one uh, at this time, unlike the other one, which was not interesting. Uh, so there's uh, an interesting question as to what should have been, what were the property, 
proper actions to have been taken in revolutionary France. Uh, I don't happen to agree with Robespierre's methods at all, but uh, we could discuss it. Interesting historical discussion. Well, let's move to Leninism, uh, totally unrelated, uh, no relation whatsoever. Uh, Leninism was, uh, in my view, counter-revolutionary. It wasn't instituting communism. Uh, there was a popular revolution, in fact, there had been for years, mm -hmm. and in through 1917 it grew very substantially from February on. Uh, Lenin basically tried to take control of it. Uh, he, uh, if you take a look at his writings in 1917, they went way to the left. Uh, April Theses, uh, State and Revolution, the most radical things he ever wrote, uh, almost anarchist. Uh, and my view and is it was basically opportunism. I don't think he believes a word of it. It seems to me he was trying to associate himself, become the leader of the revolutionary popular forces. And when he became the leader, he didn't waste much time, and Trotsky helped him in uh, instituting a, uh, a pretty repressive regime uh, uh, with not wasn't Stalin, but a lot of the basic elements of Stalinism, uh, they moved pretty quickly to uh, dismantle most of the organs of popular power, not overnight, but over not very long time they were able to basically dismantle the Soviets, the uh, factory councils, to convert the labor, of course, the uh, the peasant revolutionary forces, they were very much opposed to this, incidentally, as distinct from Marx. Marx saw revolutionary potential in the Russian peasantry. The urban communists like Lenin were strongly opposed to that. In fact, a lot of Marx's latest, later work was even suppressed because they didn't like what he was saying. But uh, So it wasn't Marx, but uh, they had contempt for the backward peasants. Uh, their conception was uh, that Russia's a backward peasant society. It has to be driven to industrialization, and then out of that, uh, you know, the iron laws of history will lead to socialism and so on, but sometime in the future. Uh, and in fact, they, they regarded Russia as a backwater. They were essentially waiting for a revolution in Germany, the most advanced capitalist country. That's where there should be a revolution. Mm -hmm. uh, when the revolution was crushed in Germany in 1919, by that time, uh, Russia had been pretty much turned into the kind of labor army that Lenin and Trotsky were advocating, not totally, but mostly crunched up, kind of finished it off. But when the uh, German revolution was crushed, they realized that's not going to work. Uh, so we have to do something else to drive Russia towards industrialization. And shortly after that comes the new economic policy, which is essentially let's introduce state capitalism, but with an iron fist, mm -hmm. uh, because we're going to drive them forward. And this is uh, Lenin's vanguardism. It was sharply criticized back in the early years of the 20th century by Marxists. Mm -hmm. In fact, his later, some of his later associates, uh, although some of the critics like Rosen Luxemburg, uh, pointed out that Lenin's program, which they regarded as pretty right-wing, and I do too, uh, was, uh, well, the image was that uh, the, uh, there'll be a proletarian revolution, the party will take over from the proletariat, the central committee will take over from the party, and uh, the maximal leader will take over from the central committee. Yeah, pretty much what happened. Mm -hmm. but, you know, not precisely, but that's roughly what happened. Uh, and after that, the use of terror to defend the uh, repressive, violent state has nothing to do with communism. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, I think this is one of the great blows to socialism in the 20th century, was the Bolshevik Revolution. I mean, it called itself socialist, and the West called it socialist. In fact, that's one thing on which the world's two major propaganda systems agreed. The, the huge propaganda system in the West mm -hmm. and the minor propaganda system in the East. And one of the few things on which they agreed was that this was socialism. Uh, the West propaganda system liked that because it's a way of defaming socialism. Right. Uh, relating it to the, um, what's going on in Russia. And uh, the, East, the, the, the Russian propaganda system liked it because uh, 
they're trying to profit from the moral uh, aura of socialism, which was quite real. So they kind of both agreed on that. And, you know, when the world's major propaganda systems agree on something, it's kind of hard for people to extricate themselves from it. So by now it's a routine that that was socialism, although it, had, it was very anti-socialist. Uh, I remember when, by the late 80s, when it was pretty clear the system was tottering, I was asked uh, by a left journal, I won't mention it, uh, to write an article on what I thought was going to happen when the system collapses. And I wrote an article in, in which I said, I, th I think it will be a small victory for socialism if the system collapses. Now, they refused to publish it. They, finally, it was published in an anarchist magazine. So that's how it appeared. But, uh, because they couldn't understand it. In fact, I wrote some of the same things in journals here, like The Nation. And they published it, but I don't think anybody understood it. Because uh, this was socialism. You know, how could you say this is anti-socialist? Well, uh, my view is it's not much unique. Um, the left Marxists had the same view. Yeah. People like Anton Panikuk, uh, Karl Korsch, others who, you know, they got uh, marginalized and eliminated because that's what happens to people who don't have guns. You know, but I think they were right. The people who Lenin condemned as the ultra left, the infantile ultra leftists. I think they were basically right, you know, not in everything, but uh, uh, that, as were a lot of the anarchist critics. And uh, early on, uh, Bertrand Russell mm -hmm. saw it pretty well early on. Uh, but, you know, by 1920, I mean, it was unmistakable, even earlier, I think even earlier. I mean, I wasn't alive then, but when I was uh, 12 years old, that seemed pretty obvious to me. Mm -hmm. Do you think that within the coordinates of the entire Marxist tradition, there will always be this danger of going towards that edge? Well, you know, I don't regard Lenin as part of the Marxist tradition, mm -hmm. frankly. I mean, what the Marxist tradition is, and who knows? No. Right. But uh, it certainly wasn't Marx's position. Uh, I, I mentioned his uh, belief um, is that uh, in the revolutionary potential of the Russian peasantry, there certainly isn't a hint of that in Lenin. I mean, after all, you know, Marx had a lot of different views. Right. Uh, for example, he thought uh, it might be possible to reach uh, socialism by parliamentary means in the more bourgeois democratic societies. England was his model, of course. He didn't rule it out. You know. Uh, and, and in fact, he, Marx didn't have very much to say about socialism or communism. You take a look at Marx's works, a very you know, deep analytic critique of a variety of capitalism, capitalist markets, the properties, imperialism, and so on. But about the future society, a couple of scattered sentences. Uh, and I think, you know, just my guess is uh, for good reasons. Uh, his picture was that, uh, as I understand it, that uh, when working people liberate themselves and can make their own decisions, they'll determine what kind of a society it'll be. It's not going to. He's not going to dictate it to them. Um, I think that's a pretty wise stand, frankly. Do you think that the the newer forms of, say, uh, authoritarian capitalism, where Authoritarian communism existed once, so for example in China, or maybe in Singapore, where it was a massive move against the left, and it instituted this sort of state capitalism, but very regimented. Do you think that that's the new danger that we face? It's a danger, and uh, there are many dangers. <laughs> of course. But, uh, yeah, I think it's a pretty rotten system, frankly. I mean, it does keep the streets clean, and you know, people get a good technical education and so on, very repressive, um, but uh, I don't think it's an admirable society by any means. Mm -hmm. There was a, a recent uh, article in uh, January 2013 by Alan Johnson um, in writing for The Telegraph, and he accused some of the leftists, specifically Zizek, of being left fascists, of promulgating this view of totalitarianism and violence as justified within the left tradition and something that we should reclaim in the 21st century. And how does this fascination with violence, terror, and 
hegemony stem from the radical left tradition? Do you think that it's a part of it, or do you think that it's sort of this offshoot? You know, the, the radical left, there's a lot of radical left traditions, but the ones that made any sense, uh, in my view, were not committed to violence, except in self-defense. So if you manage to carry forward significant changes, and the progressive changes, maybe, radic maybe institutional changes, and you start to function, and uh, there's an attack on them by um, former centers of power, by outside powers and so on, then you defend yourself. Uh, I think that's, uh, as I said, I'm not a pure pacifist. I don't think you should stop defending yourself when you're under attack, but, it, but under very special circumstances. The idea of overthrowing existing forces by violence is a very questionable one for pretty good reasons, I think. I mean, any Syria, uh, people who talk about revolution, you know, it's easy to talk about, but if you want a, re a, a revolution, meaning a, a significant change in institutions, that's going to be uh, carry us forward rather than backwards, then it has to meet a couple of conditions. Uh, one condition is it has to have uh, dedicated support by a large majority of the population, uh, people who have come to realize that the just goals that they're trying to attain cannot be attained within the existing institutional structure because they'll be beaten back by force. And if a lot of people come to that realization, then they might say, well, we'll go beyond the what's called reformism, the effort to introduce changes within the institutions that exist. At that point, the questions at least arise but we are so remote from that point that I don't even see any point speculating about it. And we may never get there. Maybe Marx is right that uh, within uh, parliamentary democracies you can uh, use the institutions themselves to uh, go to a sharp institutional change. In fact, I think there's some evidence for that. So, for example, even in the United, in the United States, uh, there are the beginnings of germs of what would be, uh, in my view, a real socialist or communist society, like worker-owned uh, enterprises. It's the beginnings of uh, 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 industrial democracy, you know, popular democracy in all institutions. And how far can it go? Well, you know, if it keeps going, if it does keep going, and there is violent resistance to it, then you could raise the question of using violence to defend it. But if it keeps going, it doesn't meet violent resistance, we'll just continue it. Very good. Going off of that, there is this sort of accusations, uh, I know since I'm a student as well, there's an accusation from some intellectuals of students today in higher education that they're not radical enough or that they focus on single issues like LGBT rights or climate change instead of focusing on radical transformation of social and economic systems in their, in their totality. What do you think the role of a student and a university is in revolutionary movements today? To be, first of all, to, under, to learn enough to understand what you're talking about. Uh, then, if your ideas are clarified enough to try to work to carry them forward. So let's take these examples. So it takes a climate change. I don't think you can discuss climate change for very long without reaching a, a very radical interpretation of the nature of existing institutions and why they have to be changed. Um, there are built-in features of our existing institutions which are leading us towards disaster uh, with regard to the climate. Built-in, you can find discussion of this in Marx if you like and so on, but uh, it's just part of market systems. Uh, we, we don't really have market systems, it's mostly fraud, but we have partial market systems. And to the extent that you have a, mar a market system, uh, inherent problems of markets do enter into operation. Uh, you can read about them in economics texts. There's a footnote that talks about market inefficiencies. So what, what are the market inefficiencies? Well, a lot of them. Uh, one of them, which is not talked about much, is that markets direct your choices in particular areas. 
like say I can choose to buy a Toyota or a Chevrolet, but I can't choose in a market system to get a subway system. That's a collective action. Market systems don't allow that. So it has an enormous distorting effect on the set of choices that are available. That's not discussed as an inefficiency, but there are plain inefficiencies, even from the point of view of markets, uh, externalities, crucially. So, for example, if you and I uh, make a transaction, we'll make, make sure that we make out okay. We're not considering the effects on that guy over there mm -hmm. that doesn't enter into market transactions. And those effects can be very substantial. Uh, in fact, we're right in the middle of one right now, the financial crisis, uh, when uh, big institutions like you know Goldman Sachs, or whatever, when they uh, uh, make some risky transaction, whatever it is, uh, the, if they're paying attention, they'll try to cover their own potential losses. Uh, but they don't pay attention to what's called systemic risk, the possibility that their failed transaction it might bring down the system. And in fact, they really don't have to worry much about that because we don't have a market system. So therefore, they can run cap in hand to the nanny state and say, bail me out, and that's what happens. Uh, but if it was a market system, that's, it would lead to a total collapse. This way it leads to massive financial disaster, and then uh, the nanny state comes in and bails you out up to a point. Uh, but th those are uh, uh, externalities. But there's a much more serious one. Uh, if, um, say, uh, uh, the business world, say, the energy corporations, or for that matter, both political parties who work f for the corporate sector, basically, <laughs> if they decide, as they are doing, that we should uh, extract every drop of oil, uh, every, of every bit of hydrocarbons from underground, including tar sands and everything else, uh, they have, you know, they're very excited about it, very euphoric. You can read it in the newspapers every day, you know, David Brooks this morning, both parties. This will be wonderful, it'll, uh, uh, it'll save us from uh, uh, subservience to Middle East oil dictators and Venezuela, for which there isn't one particle of evidence, but put that aside, and we'll be self-sufficient for energy independent for a century. Uh, but meanwhile, there's a slight externality, we'll destroy the world. Uh, okay, but that's, you don't pay attention to that in, in a quasi-market system. That's not part of the transaction. The transaction is let's make as much money as we can tomorrow, and for governments let's have as much power as we can. Uh, but not, uh, well, okay, our grandchildren won't have a world to live in. That's an externality, it's not part of the system. And, for, and here you can't run to anybody cap in hand to bail you out. So that's, a, but, I mean, this is almost inherent in the institutions we have. And you can see it happening. So if you look at, it's kind of striking when you look at the world today, there's, if there's ever a future historian, they're gonna be amazed at what they see in the early 21st century. I mean, uh, there are a variety of reactions to very likely climate uh, environmental disaster. It is very likely, in fact, not very far away, perhaps. Mm -hmm. And there are a variety of reactions. There are some that are trying to do something about it. Uh, so in the lead, trying to do something about it, are the pre-industrial societies, the indigenous societies, the uh, tribal societies, you know, First Nations in Canada, or uh, indigenous people in uh, Ecuador, Bolivia, and so on, uh, Australia, you know, all over. They're in the lead. They want to do something about it. And they are. Uh, so, for example, in, say, Ecuador, which is an oil producer, uh, the government is trying to get some support for leaving their oil in the ground, which is where it ought to be. So that's the indigenous societies. Then you go up to the richest, the most powerful societies in history, incomparable advantages, uh, peak of Western civilization. They're trying to race the disaster as fast as possible. Uh, so, 
you know, those silly Indians want to leave their oil on the ground. We want to get it out as fast as possible so we can wreck the environment for our grandchildren. That's the world we live in. Now, you can't go very far talking about climate change without running into fundamental features of our basic institutions. So I don't think this dichotomy means much. And that's true on every other issue you look at, too. Right. You very quickly run into institutional factors that are deeply rooted in the nature of the society. So you go quite quickly to a, what's called a radical critique. This doesn't have anything to do with violence and it's a side issue. Right. So do you think that for students today and in our universities, it's actually in a society like that we live in today, say, in the United States, it's important to focus on these single issues because they in themselves contain a critique of the system. It's important to begin with the issues that interest and concern you. Mm -hmm. That's just for any, almost anything. Right. But if you just look at those issues, you're quickly going to get into deeper ones. And I think you have to think about the whole range. I mean, nobody can be an activist working on everything. You know, right. That's impossible. So if you really want to do something, you're going to focus. You have to, whatever it may turn out to be. But as soon as you do focus, if you think about it, you're going to find that you're facing fundamental questions about the nature of the social and economic institutions in which we live and the political ones. And then you're going to link up with other people who are, work on their issue and they have, uh, they'll run into the same problems. Uh, so I just don't see a contradiction. That this is that's where activism leads. Very good. And so many people are asking in the wake of the Occupy movement, how are we to rebuild the left in America today, if it's even possible to have some sort of change. And I'd like to ask what your vision is for a renewed left in America today. I think, first of all, there's a lot of activism and a lot of concern on all kinds of issues, and probably more than uh, than the 60s. Uh, but it's, it's pretty scattered. It's a very atomized society, so a lot of the ac actions are scattered. I mean, right here in Boston, for example, uh, it's very striking. I give talks and around different parts of the city. There are places where they're doing the same thing as in some other part of the city, but they don't know about each other. It's, it's amazing. I mean, I found it myself. You know, I've been involved here for activism in years and years. And not long ago, I was invited to give a talk in downtown Boston by a group I'd never heard of. We're doing fantastic things. I never heard of it, you know, because it happens to be downtown Boston another one going on somewhere else. So there's a lot happening. It's got to move together. It's got to find common ground. Uh, the Occupy movement, I think, has been very successful, very brief, in a very brief period, you know, a couple of months after all. It, uh, it changed the discourse in the country. It changed a lot of the perceptions and mentality. It brought a lot of people together. It's uh, contrary to what's claimed. It's active and functioning, doing a lot of important things like uh, actions on foreclosures, uh, even hit the news recently with uh, being the first on the scene after the Hurricane Sandy and uh, uh, many things going on and that's all to the good and uh, I mentioned before that there are other things happening like uh, say the development of worker-owned enterprises. That could be happening right here. There are if there were an active movement, it could be involved in similar initiatives which begin to take off, but often are aborted because they don't have enough popular support. There could give you some real cases if we had time. And uh, uh, reaching out into, um, the, one of the very good initiatives of the Occupy movement was the Occupy the Hood uh, spin-offs. I don't know how far they got actually farther than people think, I believe. I, I didn't think they got very far, but I have met groups, activist groups, working in uh, the uh, so-called ghettos and the slums, who were spin-offs of this and are still working and doing interesting things, in fact, growing. So I think they're probably out there. You know, we don't hear a lot. Uh, uh, of course, the, the media obviously aren't going to cover it, but uh, we also don't use our own options it's quite striking that you take a look at the left the last 40 years. Uh, uh, one of the very sharp criticisms it's had is of the media. Uh, they don't do the things we ought to be doing. 
That's true. They're not going to corporate media. Uh, but there are oppor opportunities. Always have been. So when uh, Congress passed the law 40, 40 years ago, I guess, uh, distributing the rights to cable television, uh, there was a component of the law which required the uh, private companies that got the monopoly, which is very profitable, to require them to put up public cable, cable facilities. And they did. So in Cambridge and you know, Lexington, uh, pounds all over the place, there are public cable facilities. I've been on them occasionally. They're, it's not CBS. But, you know, by uh, standards of most countries, it's unbelievably good. Do we use them? Almost never. Almost nothing. No, there's some things, but uh, like the came, you can reach an awful lot of people that way if you do something about it. But you have to do it, you know. And uh, Boston, again, is an interesting city, and there's a lot of activism, but it's one of the cities that basically has no uh, public... No, has no community radio. Um, small things here and there, but you know, other a lot of other communities have community radio. But when you travel around the country and you see, you see that in places where there is a community, a live community radio station with a lot of public participation and so on, the people know what other people are doing. It's a way of bringing people together. And uh, uh, if, if you don't have it, it's scattered. But you know, those are not insuperable barriers. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be done, and I think out of that can grow. Whatever movement will grow out of it depends what the participants uh, decide to commit themselves to. Very good. My last question, yeah. so I don't keep you. Um, Slavoj Žižek, in an interview to the New Statement in 2009, said about you, My friend told me Chomsky said something very sad. He said that today we don't need theory. All we need to do is tell people, empirically, what is going on. Here I violently disagree. Facts are facts and they are precious, but they can work in this way or that. Facts alone are not enough. You have to change the ideological background. I'm sorry, I'm an old-fashioned continental European. Theory is sacred and we need it more than ever. How would you respond to this claim? I have a sense of, I mean, first of all, I quite agree that just you know, spewing out facts means nothing. And uh, in our discussion here, we haven't just been spewing out facts. It's within a framework, it's in with a framework of understandings and principles and so on. Uh, in uh, the European intellectuals, he's talking about have a concept of theory, which in my view is totally divorced, div almost radically divorced from facts and radically divorced from theory. It's mostly big, complicated words that uh, may be fun for intellectuals to throw around to each other, but uh, and most of it, I think, is gibberish, to tell you the honest truth. It's not theory in any sense that I understand, and I've been involved most of my life in the sciences where there are theories and so on, so sure, if you can find a theory that has some real principles and uh, which are of some interest, and uh, uh, you can draw conclusions from them, which you can apply to um, interpreting the actual world around you, sure, that's wonderful. Uh, but, uh, and if there are such theories, you know, I'm happy to see them, but uh, I, I don't find them when I read uh, a Paris uh, postmodernist uh, talk. You know, what I see is uh, intellectuals uh, uh, kind of uh, interacting with one another in ways which are incomprehensible to the public and, to be frank, incomprehensible to me. So sure, let's have uh, theories that have some intellectual content, some uh, consequences, uh, can be refined, changed, lead us to better understanding. It's fine. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. I really yeah. appreciate it.